Sometime during the mid-1960s, a man named Ed Cobb and his girlfriend had a run-in with a mugger. It happened in Boston, and it gave rise to a song. The song's name was Dirty Water. The Sandell, Standells debuted the song in April of 1966, and it went to number eight on the charts. Most hits from the 1960s have long since died a merciful death, but not the song Dirty Water. That's because the Boston Bruins began playing that song after every home victory. That was in 1991. 1997, the Boston, uh, the Red Sox began doing the same thing. And the Standells, the surviving Standells I read online, have even played the song from the top of the Green Monster after Boston wins a game. Well, I love that dirty water, oh Boston, you're my home. Let's hope they get to play that song a whole lot this summer, or at least start playing it or whatever. Dirty water may be fun to sing about from the top of the green monster in Boston, but green, dirty water is no fun if you're a fish. For a salmon, and we've been talking over this last month or so about the upstream run that salmon make and comparing that to our own faith journey and the culture that we live in, for a salmon, and for any fish, nothing is more important than healthy gills. Uh, it all stops and starts right there. Uh, the gills are the fish's lungs, uh, as you can imagine. They don't do very well breathing air the way we do. They pass water through those slits, those gills, and this, this very, very special tissue extracts oxygen from the water. But also a lot of other things are going on with those gills in terms of their electrolyte balance and just the whole chemistry of being a fish. Uh, whether in the freshwater phase, back in the saltwater phase, or coming back to freshwater as they do that upstream journey. And if those gills become diseased, if they become infected with parasites, if they become clogged with, with pollutants that are in the water, the fish dies. It cannot do that upstream journey. Waterfalls and swamps may be powerful obstacles to that journey. The current is always pushing against the fish's effort to swim upstream. But unseen and ever-present pollution in the river will make the difference between life and death. Now, in our upstream journey following Jesus, we face powerful, unseen pollutants that can weaken us to the point we're no longer either able or willing to take that upstream journey. These pollutants are all around us. Uh, they become so much a part of our world that we take them for granted. They're in our culture. They're not necessarily things that are announced or programmed. They're just present. Present as ways of thinking about the world. Uh, assumptions. Little practices that people have. Uh, things that people do in addition to perhaps even having a faith journey in following Jesus. And they attack at the very heart of our spiritual life. As Paul wrote to the Christians, the same Christians we're going to get to know this morning... In Ephesians 6, 11 to 12, he said, put on God's complete armor so that you can successfully resist all the devil's methods of attack. For our fight is not against any physical enemy. It is against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are up against the unseen power that controls this dark world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. See, we're talking here not about things that are necessarily uh, the talk of the town. Not just talking about the great scandals or, the, or the, the, the very obvious sins of various people in our culture. We're talking about something unseen. Just the same way that pollution, whether it be in the air or whether it be in the water that we drink, is unseen. We're all familiar with the, the problems that people have been having downstate uh, in the southern part of the state where those uh, various chemicals uh, have gotten into the soil and have found their way into the wells. And, of course, people were drinking the water oblivious to the fact that the water wasn't good for them. And it's only been now, after 20 or 30 years, that we're trying to figure out how to deal with that. Well, the same thing is going on when it comes to our upstream journey of following Jesus and swimming in this culture. Now, you may remember, the premise of this whole idea of swimming upstream is that we are in the river of this culture. We can't be anywhere else. We are to embrace and love this world that God has put us in. We just don't swim where the river's going. We swim the other way. But what's going on in the river has a whole lot to do with how healthy we are and how we respond. And I want to talk to you this morning then about pollution, spiritual pollution, 
that may or may not be affecting you right now. It may not even be something you think about. Uh, it, you may, in fact, have some things going on in your thought life or in your, in your practices that you just sort of think are um, sort of on the, on the side, not a big deal. Uh, maybe a way of just kind of coping or getting by. And yet those things may be robbing you of the full spiritual vitality that God means for you. Or worse, they can even cause us to give up on our journey of following Jesus. The city of Ephesus, in what is now southern Turkey, was the third largest city in the Roman Empire during the time of Paul. It was also in many ways the most superstitious. It was famous for its superstition. As Bruce Metzger writes, quote, Of all the ancient Greco-Roman cities, Ephesus, the third largest city in the empire, was by far the most hospitable to magicians, sorcerers, and charlatans. This place was given over completely to any kind of spiritual practice, any kind of occult activity, all sorts of things, and anything goes environment. A kind of like what the United States is becoming, huh? In just even in recent years, where it just seems that any new spiritual practice, however weird, or however dark, however it would have been thought of as out of sorts and inappropriate years ago, is now front page stuff. Ephesus was dominated by a massive temple, the temple to Artemis. Now this temple was one of the wonders of the world. It was four times larger, just the temple building, four times larger than the Parthenon. If you're familiar with Athens and with that beautiful temple that sits there uh, to this day on top of that hill, imagine a, a temple four times in that size. Uh, this temple served as a worship center. It served as the court for the entire area. It was the bank. It was the library and the archives. It was also the place where you went for asylum if you were a runaway slave or if you'd committed a crime or couldn't pay your debts. You could go to this huge temple and all of its vast enclosures and, and find asylum. This temple and its priests held vast real estate uh, holdings and even sent their, they even sent their own athletes to the Olympic Games. In short, this temple was the foundation of the entire culture of that region. So when you thought Ephesus, you didn't think of the book of Ephesians that Paul wrote. You thought about a pagan city with perhaps one of the largest temples of the ancient world. You thought of a place of anything goes spiritually, all kinds of things going on. Fortune tellers and sorcerers and magicians and charlatans and people offering snake oil cures for this, that, and the other thing. You thought of a place that was just riddled with the occult. Now inscribed on the, the statue of Artemis, the goddess of this city, were magical words around her neck and I think around her ankles and so on. And these magical words were spells that if you spoke them in the right way, you were supposed to get magical power, power over evil spirits and so on. In fact, scholars have discovered that these words and many, many other hundreds of examples like them were found all over Ephesus. Ephesus became the center of spell writing. <laughs> so much so that spells were called Ephesus writings. And they were written down in books and scrolls and on little amulets that you would wear around your neck and on statues and so on. And the idea was that if you got these magic words and said them just the right way, said the spell just the right way, you could make things happen. You could make somebody love you even if he or she didn't want to. You could predict who would win the next chariot race. You could cure diseases. You could get, even get mice and bugs out of your house. You could put a hex on an enemy. You had power that you wouldn't have otherwise. No wonder then that this place was crawling with magicians and sorcerers. Here was a place where anything was possible. Just make sure you had the secret formula. Dirty water. Dirty water spiritually speaking. Magic, you see, is the bottom feeder of spirituality. It's based upon the notion that if you say the right words or perform the right action or maybe have the right rabbit foot in your pocket or whatever your little gizmo is, if you just do the thing right, you can manipulate some deity or the entire supernatural world. No relationship necessary. 
No honoring of a God or no moral code that you have to follow. No commitment whatsoever. Just power. If I say these words, presto, I get what I want. If I do this little ritual, presto, I get what I want. If I don't Use the, if I don't do certain things on Friday the 13th, I'm safe. Not because God loves me, not because I'm being a moral person, not because of any kind of notion of commitment to anybody. It's just that I found a little trick that helps me get through life. It's sort of like cheat codes in video games. A video game creates a world. Any of you who've played video games or had uh, family members who did or whatever know that a video game creates an entire world that in a sense you enter into, at least sort of virtually, in order to play the game. And every one of these little worlds has rules. In some of these worlds you can fly, in some of them you can't. In some of them you can shoot forever, in others you run out of bullets. In some of them you have multiple lives, and in others you don't. And you have to play by the rules of the game. Uh, the game may be a little bit like earthly life, but It'll have some other aspects to it so that you have to learn how that game works. And you're just as limited in the video game as you and I are limited here. I mean, you know, no matter how much fun it would be to fly, none of us can flap our arms and just rise out of our seats. Our world doesn't do that. So in the video game, there you are and you're, you're going along and you're trying to make the game happen. You want to win. And you get stuck. Of course, they make the game hard enough so you get stuck. And you come up against this big monster at the end of a level and you just can't beat that monster. And you get defeated and you're thrown back to the beginning of the game. And round and round you go. Or maybe, you know, you, you just want to have power so that when you're playing this game, you can beat your friend and you can see through a wall or fly over an obstacle or whatever. Well, that's where the cheat code comes in. A cheat code is a little password. Or sometimes it's a sequence of, of commands on your, on your controller. And if you have this secret information, secret as in it's all over the internet, but at least it's not there in front of you in the game. If you have this secret information and you enter that at the right time, then you suddenly take on godlike characteristics in the game. You have power. You can make things happen. Maybe you become immortal. Maybe you can fly. Maybe your gun can shoot farther. Whatever the little trick is, you have this secret code that gives you power in your little world. Well, you see, magic does the same thing, or at least promises to do the same thing. If you just have the secret information, then you can manipulate your world. It might be something as simple as opening up the paper, or nowadays, I'm sure, going to an app and finding out what your horoscope is for the day, and reading this little, little tidbit and saying, okay, now let's see, when was I born? And finding your sign and hooking yourself up with that. And then it'll kind of give you an idea, supposedly, as to whether or not today would be a good day to, I don't know, invite somebody out on a date or try for a new job or whatever. And you try to parse out of that, you know, that horoscope writing, which basically doesn't tell you anything, and try to figure out out of that whether you can get a little bit of an edge on the world around you. Some extra power. A little boost. And the same thing goes on to this day all over our world. Magic presumes the existence of a spiritual world that controls our lives. But if you have the code, you can manipulate those forces. You can manipulate those powers. Now this is what Ephesus was all about. It was just riddled with this magical thinking. And Luke tells us that when Paul set up shop in Ephesus, Ephesus and when he taught in the city for over two years, God began to work miracles through him. Now imagine the impact a miracle would have in a place that was already super primed for the supernatural. We read in Acts 19 verse 11 and 12, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Imagine, here's a place where people are already spiritually hungry, where they already want to believe, they already want things to happen. I mean, these are, this is not a society in which everybody was suspicious and skeptical. 
you know, looking for the scientific proof behind everything that, that a, a believer might say. No, these people were on the other end of the extreme. And when Paul began to talk about Jesus, people began to be healed. And just as has happened in other places, these dark spirits began to be, uh, be cast out of people as they put their faith in Jesus. Imagine the impact on the population. Luke goes on to tell us how the locals, in particular some Jewish exorcists, tried to copy Paul. They saw that when Paul talked about Jesus, things happened. Well, guess what they did? They said, oh, that must be the cheat code. Oh, name of Jesus is cheat code. You want to get something to happen, just say, name of Jesus, and then the spirits have to do their thing. No commitment to God. No relationship, no understanding that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose again and has a, God has a plan for his whole creation. No relationship with this God. No notion of you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your whole mind, and your soul, and your mind, and your strength. This was just the old video game cheat code approach. Just say these words and hey, we'll have stuff happen the way this Paul has stuff happen. Well, turns out that that wasn't a very good idea. Uh, they tried it. And it's one of the more, in a way, kind of humorous uh, sections of the book of Acts. Uh, seven of these exorcists, one guy, seven exorcists, and they all got in there and started talking about the Jesus that Paul talks about. <laughs> in other words, we don't know who this Jesus is, but his name seems to be important. And the evil spirit, speaking through the man who was possessed, said, well, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but I don't know who you are. And then this one man proceeded to beat the seven men up, stripped them of all their clothes, and sent them out into the street. At that point, Ephesus took notice. Here was supreme spiritual power. Here was something bigger than cheat codes. Here was something bigger than the fake the fake spirituality of all of those charlatans and you know how those sometimes those those predictions of the future really have more about to do with how what you read into them than actually telling you anything and these people were pretty jaded and now all of a sudden they saw God's power displayed the Lord of the world Jesus wasn't a name to be worked into a magic spell this Jesus wasn't a spiritual force to be manipulated. This idea of trusting in Jesus wasn't just a, a little cheat code that you could pull out of your pocket uh, when you needed a little extra something from the spirit world. This Jesus was the creator God who had come in human flesh and blood to die for our sins and give us eternal life. He was God's love in person. He was the conqueror of those spirits that everybody was trying to manipulate with their little magic lines. The only way to respond to this God was to love him in return. This God wasn't for sale. This God wasn't just something you could put in your back pocket. And the failure of the Jewish exorcist to use Jesus as a cheat code had an amazing impact. We read in verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. All of a sudden, the light of who God really is was shining into that very confused and dark place. And it wasn't just anything goes anymore. And it wasn't just, well, I think my magic's a little better than your magic. Or it wasn't just, well, how much do you want for that? Yeah, how much it was going to cost me to have my palm read or have my cards read or have my fortune told? Now, all of a sudden, Jesus, the Lord of the world, was present in the teaching and activities of Paul. And we read that something else happened. Something that had to do with this upstream journey. This whole idea of what kind of water you're swimming in and what you're willing to put up with. Those who had already become Christians found that they had some serious house cleaning to attend to. Listen to what happened next. This is verses 18 to 20. Many of those who had believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 days wages. 50,000 days wages. 
In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. What was going on here? Now, here are people living in this city that was given over to the occult. It was what, this, what the culture was all about. At some level or another, the occult was everywhere in that culture. From the, from the very uh, organized religion all the way down to how you got through the day. And these believers were Christians who had been content to continue swimming in the spiritual pollution of the occult. They lived there. They probably had practiced these things as just a matter of course over many years. Now they accept Jesus... They're on a new journey with Jesus, but they still had their scrolls as a backup. They still had those other practices as a, as a just in case. Jesus may have been Lord in some areas of their lives, but not in every area of their world. And now they could see with Jesus, it's all or nothing. When it comes to doing this journey of going following God's plan and going upstream to the place where God is calling us, uh, there isn't any place for compromise. Think about the journey the salmon makes, going from the ocean some 900 miles, in the case of the sockeye salmon, up into the mountains, of uh, way up into the Rockies, climbing 7,000 uh, feet of altitude over the course of months. Uh, there isn't a day off on that journey. You stop swimming, guess what the river does? Floats you back downstream. Now, you can't sort of say, well, I think I'll do a little bit today. And, you know, if you take a break, you just made yourself three more days of work. And the same is true in our spiritual journey. Uh, when we're following Jesus, that's something we do every day. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross when? Do you know what it says? <laughs> Daily. And follow me. No, it's not just something you did when you were 23 years old and you said a little prayer. And, and now you go on with your life as if nothing changed. It's a daily thing. It's a journey. And it's about us becoming more and more like the God who created us. Being a force for God's love and God's presence. Uh, it's a journey he gives us energy for. It's a journey that brings his joy into our lives. But it's not something you can do while you're doing some other journey at the same time. All or nothing. No compromise. So these believers made a clean break burning a fortune of occult paraphernalia. And in so doing, Luke says, God's word spread ever more widely and grew in power. I remember having a car, and I was overseas at this time, and the gas that we, that we put in the car came in 55-gallon drums, which were probably as old as time and were covered with rust on the inside. So the gasoline was literally red with rust when you'd pour it out. And we would filter it and do all kinds of things to try to clean it up. But course a lot of that still went into the gas tank and I had this Volkswagen bus and I'd ride around and oh for a year or so it was running fine it started running a little slower I didn't didn't really notice it and it ran a little slower a little slower it's one of those things where you go boy I wonder what's with this car I, I put it in second and it doesn't really jump anymore and then one day it just barely crept along and I'm out there thinking what am I going to do I mean, the car is like your lifeline. My car is not running. This is terrible. And again, God's so gracious. I'm not a mechanic. I never took a course in anything like that. But the Holy Spirit said, look under the car. I looked underneath and there was a fuel filter. Uh, this car had a gas tank at one end and a motor at the other and a big long fuel line. And right in the middle of it was this plastic canister. So I looked at it and I said, hmm, that thing looks really red and rusty. I'll bet it wasn't that way when we started. So uh, this is the limit of my, my mechanical expertise. I took the filter off. I happened to have another one. Put it on. Got in the car. And it took off like a jackrabbit. I mean, <laughs> man. It was like, wow. That's amazing. Well, obviously, it's a pretty simple problem. Over months and months and months, that filter had gotten more and more filled with rust. And of course, for a while, the car ran fine. And then it ran not quite as fine, but I wasn't noticing that it was really slowing down. And then you know how it is. It's like, well, maybe it's just this hill's a little steeper than I remember it. And you know, you're not really noticing the degrading until finally the filter <laughs> plugged. And now gas was barely trickling through. You see, that's what pollution does. It doesn't all come all at once. It's not like that waterfall that says to the fish, you can't go by. And the fish has to say, well, I'm either jumping you or my journey's over. 
Pollution is something that accumulates over time. And I know as we look at water quality issues and air quality issues and, and we try to find ways to make our environment a, a cleaner and, and more pure uh, environment, the studies tell us that the problems typically come after years of exposure to various pollutants. Uh, yeah, one glass of, of this water from a particular site probably won't cause a problem. But boy, if you drank that from the time you were a little kid right up through high school, you might have very serious problems. Well, you see, that's what goes on with this spiritual pollution in our culture. This bottom feeder spirituality is present in everything in our culture, from the daily horoscope with its supposed glimpse to the future, to the promise of power or healing through spirit guides and incantations, crystals and rituals, We've got all sorts of religious ideas floating around. Some of them are called New Age. Some of them are very much connected with, with the use of drugs to, to experience altered states of consciousness. These are old ideas. They've been around forever. Back in Roman times, it was quite customary to use any number of, of drugs to induce a, an altered state. Uh, the great drinking parties uh, that you read about, the orgies, typically had wines that were spiced with various concoctions, various herbs, and so on, to create a different mindset, even to cause a person then to feel that they were in touch with the spiritual realm. Same thing is going on today. Like the Ephesians, Christians today, you and I today, are tempted to add a little magic to our belief system to cover all the bases. Sometimes it's when we come against a real-life crisis. And we just aren't sure that Jesus is either big enough for that problem or that he cares enough or that our faith is strong enough or whatever. And somebody comes along and suggests some, some other little thing. And, you know, the temptation is to say, well, okay, I'm not going to give up on Jesus. I'm not going to, because I, I don't want to risk whatever that would look like. But what, what would hurt if I do the Jesus thing and I do this other little thing as well? And maybe that will kind of sort of cover a base that maybe God didn't quite cover. You see how that compromise comes in? When that starts, we're no longer 100% for Jesus. We've got divided loyalties. And we begin then to look at the two and see which one's working better today. And as we kind of look at the two, then whichever one seems to be a little stronger, we're going to tend to go that way. And pretty soon we're not taking our faith journey anymore. We're just looking for power. We're looking for a little break. We're trying to run our little world instead of following Jesus on the path that he's called us to. This pollution that poisons our spirituality undermines our ability to trust God alone. See, as Christians, we're called to do something that probably most people in our society think is totally crazy. You put all your eggs in one basket? You say that God revealed through Jesus is enough, capital E, enough? No other form of spirituality necessary or permitted? Well, it's sort of like asking the salmon, you're going to swim upstream again today? And what about tomorrow? You're still going upstream? Don't you think this is a nice pool over here? Wouldn't you like to go kind of just sort of hang out under this nice big tree here? No, nope, I got a mission to go on. And you know, whenever it comes to accomplishing something in this life, whether it be your spiritual journey or whether it be the goals that you have for succeeding in this world, it's the people who stay on task who, who win the prize. If that's true in our spiritual journey. Don't be fooled by seductive and increasingly popular forms of spirituality. They're 100% antithetical to following Jesus. There's no place for that dirty water. And the good news is that God has made a way for us to stay free of the pollution in our culture and in our world. Now, the salmon doesn't have much choice, does it? The, the fish in the stream are stuck with whatever human beings dump into the stream. All they can do is swim past it if, and try to find cleaner water. But in writing to the Ephesians, the same people who burned their documents and their, their scrolls and who came clean with God, Paul says, here's how you can stay on track. Wear the armor that God gives you. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore, put 
put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Armor, something they would have been very familiar with because Roman soldiers were everywhere. And so the armor is described according to what a Roman soldier would have worn. A belt of truth to protect from subtle lies about, from, that would come from our spiritual foe. The breastplate of righteousness, perhaps the most striking part of ancient armor, would cover your whole chest and back. It defines us as belonging to God's family. Sandals of peace carry us forward on our faith journey. Always a reminder that we're on the move. The shield of faith protects us from the flaming arrows of the evil one. A helmet, the helmet of salvation, protects our thoughts from discouragement and deception. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you have that. If you have your Bible, whether it's here or whether, you're, whether your Bible is here, and hopefully a whole bunch of your Bible gets to be here, that is your weapon. That is God's one offensive weapon that He puts in our hands. God's words, God's truth, that we use to keep ourselves pure from other things that would, 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 would crowd in and cause us to, go, to fall away from the journey God has called us on. So think about the biggest challenges that you're facing in your life right now. What are you counting on to make things better? And when it comes to maybe a financial issue, and you know, you're thinking about, well, you know, we just, we've got to get this kid through that first year of college, or we need to pay off this medical bill, or we really need to get some work done on the car, or whatever it is. Uh, you know, when the Megabucks commercial comes on, Do you sort of say, God, give me some numbers? <laughs> Is there a little tug that says, hmm, maybe that's the way that this gets fixed. I take my chances. Or do we say, you know, Lord, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We're going to trust him. We're going to ask him to show me how to go forward. Who or what are you counting on to help you move forward? This is not easy stuff. I'm not talking here just about playing in the sandbox of spirituality. I'm talking about what do we do when our back's to the wall? When we feel out of options? And when there looks like a quick fix? You know, I've watched my, my son play video games. And you know, there were times when you're watching like an 8 or 9 or 10 year old kid. And he gets to that same point. And I watched my grandson, his son, do the same thing. And they work on it and they work on it. And after a while, we're all kind of standing there rooting for him. And they come up against that problem and the big monster, whack, 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 and they're done. And you see the little kids just, huh. And you're just thinking, if I could just do something for this little guy so he could win. And we could all have some peace around this house. <laughs> do we reach for the cheat code? When that time comes in our own lives or in the lives of a loved one, do we reach for the cheat code, go for the cheap spirituality? Or do we say, you know, God is growing something in me here and we're going to find out what it is. We're going to jump this thing. We're going to swim out of this. We're not going to take in that pollution. Can you say with full confidence that Jesus is all I need? Jesus is all I need. If not, it's time to come clean. Time to burn some scrolls. Time to take some ideas that we may have brought along with us, maybe from high school, maybe from college, maybe from just out in the workplace, maybe from TV shows or, or other sites that we might browse on. It's time to take those things and bring them to Jesus and say, I'm, I'm renouncing this stuff. I'm going to be 100% committed to you, Lord, in my heart, my soul, and my mind. That's the way we get back to our upstream journey. No dirty water. Can we bow our heads together and ask our prayer team to come up? Like I said, this is hard stuff. We're needy people. If you're not needy right now, enjoy, enjoy the break. Because times come eventually when we don't have the options we don't have the strength 
And my, my, my appeal to you this morning is in those times, let your spiritual reflex be to go deeper with God. And say, Lord, I'm, I'm pressing in further. What, what do we sing? Cornerstone. You're my cornerstone. You're the foundation. I'm not starting a new building project. I'm not starting a new religion. I'm not starting a new spirituality just because things got tough or because maybe I just wanted a little bit more of the good stuff of life. I'm going to go deeper with you. Examine your heart right now. Let's stand together. We're going to sing and we have prayer time up here. If you have a need for prayer, whatever it might be for yourself or someone else. And otherwise, I want to encourage you just to let God speak to you and to spend a little bit of time with him as we come to the close of our service. We're going to take a few moments for a response. Let's sing together.